all, we want to welcome you to Lighthouse Fellowship Church Living Room Bible Study at my house, Pastor Tony Richmond, and uh, on uh, Wayne Street in Salina, Ohio. And our church address is 817 North Sugar Street, Salina, Ohio. So we want to invite you to our uh, open church service now. We are back in the building. We're so glad to be back in there. And so we want to encourage you to be there for Father's Day with us if you can. And so we're looking forward to what God is doing. We are in the, in the middle of uh, purchasing the balance of our church right now. And we're looking for uh, the help that can come God from God and, and uh, for your prayers as we try to close on this and try to get everything all worked out. We've been buying the church for 12 years now. We've got a balance that we're looking to pay off. And we're going for a loan to finish that off. And we need your prayers about that. We appreciate it too. So now we are in Galatians chapter 3. And as we're in Galatians chapter 3, we'll be starting in a little bit at uh, verse 19, going to the end of the chapter, which is uh, verse 29. But before we do that, uh, we want to have you look with us, if you will, at uh, the beginning of chapter 3. And we'll see a, a quote from, from Paul that is a, an amazing quote. And he's very dramatic when he says it. The way he says it. Now let's let's look at, let's look at this, if you will, verse one. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So as we look at the function of the law here in, in just a few minutes. I just wanted to remind you of where Paul is coming from. He was saying to the Galatian people as he's speaking to the Galatian people. Remember, it's southern Galatia most likely that he's, uh, he's, he's talking to. And these are several churches together that uh, these this uh, letter goes out to. And it will go from one church to the other. And uh, it's not to a particular church. It's to that area southern Galatia. So as we look at this, he's saying to them that they're acting foolish. They're acting foolish because they have obeyed the truth of God's word and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. So why would they think they need to go back and worship God in the way that the Jews were at this time without Christ being the main factor? Well, not that he wasn't the factor in their salvation. Of course, they recognized Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they were thinking they needed something more that the Jews were telling them. They were called Judaizers, which would follow Paul around, and they would try to get people to, not all those Christians, those that had truly been saved, they would try to get those Christians to take upon themselves the Jewish traditions and the Mosaic law uh, so that they would be more like they were. Uh, and so somehow the Jewish Christians thought that they were maybe a step above other people in that they had the law and they wanted to still con function from the Mosaic law and the traditions of, Mo of Moses, of the Jewish law. So this was not the case. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. So we need to keep this in mind. He said, "You are you foolish? Are you so foolish? You began in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? The fleshly laws that they had added to, man-made laws, they had added to the laws of Moses. Of course, this is where we get the Ten Commandments from the laws of Moses. So it's a good thing. It's a moral thing that we get the Ten Commandments. But there was added to it a lot of things that did not apply to us necessarily today and would cause us to be encumbered and in bondage again to man-made traditions. And so this was not what needed to happen. Verse 19 says about the function of the law. We're going to look at that now, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So here God's word was given from a heavenly, in a heavenly way, uh, through angels and through Christ and through God himself and men that would write uh, the word uh, as such as Moses, who would, God wrote 
the commandments with his finger. If you remember on the tablets, the two tablets of the law. And we, we know that when Moses came down from the mount, he had to wear a veil because he had been with God and uh, he had not seen God face to face, but he, he saw the back of God is what it was saying for the hinder parts, which would mean he didn't see him face to face. However, he saw enough of God that his face was glowing and he had to wear a veil when he came down from the mountain. Otherwise, and, or if he hadn't done that, it would have been blinding to the people and who knows what it would have done to them if they had seen the blinding light of his face, the glow that was going on. But anyway, uh, as we get through this, uh, we can see that the uh, wherefore then serveth the law. What purpose, uh, Paul is saying, does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come uh, to whom the promise was made. Now he's talking, the seed that he's coming, uh, the promise was made to Abraham, but it was going to be, uh, the promise was made for the one that was going to come and fulfill the law, which was Jesus Christ. It was about Jesus Christ. It was about the Messiah coming to fulfill the purpose of the law. So this is very important that we grasp this. The Old Testament people say, well, what, was the, what good is the Old Testament then? Well, see, the Old Testament pointed people toward the coming of the Messiah. The New Testament points people back to Christ having come and fulfilled the law and the prophecies. So it's very important that we see that they lived in faith, believing the Messiah would come. We live in faith, believing that Jesus Christ had come and that he was he died on the cross uh, buried in the tomb and rose again uh, after the third day victorious over death hell and the grave and so we have faith to believe he has come they had faith to believe he would come and then when we have that faith and we exercise that faith in jesus christ as our savior god's word says that the holy spirit comes within us jesus christ comes to live within us through the holy spirit and we now have we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. God's Word also says that uh, we are convicted of our sins uh, by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. So when we hear the Word of God, when we read the Word of God, we hear it preached, we read it, uh, when, then what happens is the, our sin, the Holy Spirit, using God's Word. So God uses His Word. The Holy Spirit uses His Word. And once we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. We are filled with uh, by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, and our hearts are changed. God's Word says we, be, we, uh, we have now, we have a clean heart. Our heart has been cleansed. We are a new creature. So being a new creature, we don't think the way we used to. We don't want to do the things we used to do. God has saved us, and He's caused us to step beyond the responsibility of thinking that we had to fulfill man's responsibility, man's thinking. We don't have to do that. We need to fill, fulfill God's uh, bidding and his responsibility in our lives through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. And God helps us to do that because he gives us discernment through the Holy Spirit. And God's Word says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, which would be the day Jesus comes back or the day that we pass from this earth into eternal life. And by the way, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we don't just pass into eternity. We pass into eternal, we, we, we receive eternal life when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And then when we pass away, we pass into eternity, into the presence of God. Paul said it this way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So don't let anybody confuse you about that. God's Word also talks about that we, when he comes back, we will receive our new body. We must, uh, this mortal body has to put away, uh, be put away, and the, uh, the new body that God gives us, we, we will have that. And so we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But Jesus, it also says in Thessalonians, Jesus comes back. He comes back with the spirits of those who have gone on to be with him, but then they will receive first their new bodies and those which are alive uh, on the earth at that time will receive their bodies. It's only right that God would do that because 
those that have been without, you know, in heaven with, with the Father, as, as Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So they're coming back. And when Jesus is coming back, he'll come back out in the clouds like he left. And remember the angel said to the disciples, why stand you gazing up? The same Jesus which is, was going up will be coming back in the same manner. So when we realize that, we have to understand that the law is a good thing because it helps us to realize that we're lost. One preacher said it this way, and I think it's a, a good way to say it. In fact, I've heard this from a lot of people that have been, been preaching God's Word and teaching God's Word. We have to realize we're lost before we can get saved. So when we realize that there's no hope in eternal life without Jesus Christ, and that according to God's word, Romans 3.23 says, There's none of us righteous, no, not one. And 6.23 says, but the wages of, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we need Jesus Christ as our Savior when we come to a realization through the law that we're lost because we are in sin. They had the sacrifices that they had to depend upon and and they had to stand before a priest and, and have these sacrifices offered in their behalf. But the fact is, that was an imperfect system. Now we've got a wonderful system through Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of what the Old Testament pointed toward, the coming of Jesus Christ, the fulfilling of the promise that was handed to Abraham, that his seed, which includes you and I, as those that have come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, that his seed, is now us and his seed also being our forerunner Jesus Christ who was the one that was able to give us eternal life and so when we've trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior Jesus the Christ he is the Messiah he is the one that has paid the price and caused you and I to be saved when we trust in him so it's all important that we remember this and we know this that Jesus had come to fulfill the promise that was given to Abraham, the promise wasn't only that Abraham's seed was going, he would be the father of many nations. It was more than that. He was also the father of Jesus Christ to come. How about that? Now, I'm not talking about God the Father. I'm talking about it was through the seed of Abraham that Jesus Christ ended up being born, the seed of Abraham. If you remember, Mary had the child, and that child was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Heavenly Father was his father. Not Joseph, not the man that raised Jesus, but it was the Father in heaven, God the Father. And, uh, and when Mary had that child, uh, the name of Jesus Christ at that time, according to God's word, uh, he, it was a... It was going to be Emmanuel, and that was his name. He was going to be called Jesus, of course, and he was referred to as Emmanuel, which means God among us. It's important that we understand these things, how the law played into what was going to happen uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Jesus didn't do away with it. He came to fulfill it. And when he was asked by the scribes and the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? What they were asking was, uh, what one of these commandments do you think is the greatest so that they could say and argue with me and say no now How can you say that but you know, but what he did Jesus's answer was wonderful. He said The, the, the Ten Commandments of, of those Ten Commandments the greatest if you'll fulfill these two You'll fulfill all of them to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart mind strength and soul and thy neighbor as thyself And you will fulfill all of them Those are the greatest and they could not argue that point with him, and they did not argue the point. They realized there was nothing they could say. The wisdom of God through Jesus Christ was there. So when we look at this, uh, uh, read the last part of that verse. Till the seed should come of to whom the promise was made, and it was obtained by angels in the hand of one of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one yeah, it was meant to happen god caused this to happen and it was his plan from the beginning he knew what man was going to do he knew that man was fallible adam and eve in the garden of eden can you imagine the splendor that they had there 
and the wonder that you, they must have imagined and seen. That they, it wasn't just imagined, it was reality. They lived in the Garden of Eden. Wow, wonderful. And of course, I believe heaven's going to be everything as great or greater than the Garden of Eden. But the fact was is that they needed to have God, God's help. They needed, they, and they had to pay for that sin. This is where sin came into the world when they sinned, Adam and Eve. They took of that forbidden fruit. Then they began to, then they got, received that knowledge of good and evil, which before that, all they knew was good. But when you get the knowledge of good and evil, then you begin to understand, as mankind began to, how to do the wrong things, which was not a good thing to have to experience. So now, uh, God's word says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's the definition of sin, by the way, right from God's word. If you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin. Remember now, sin isn't just doing the wrong thing. It's also not doing the right things, which is living for God, doing the things that God wants us to do. So now let's look at this. Um, verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. In other words, right here it's saying that the law was not perfect. And, but the, is the law against the promises of God? Of, of course not. God forbid. If there had been a law which could have been given, that could have given life or eternal life, that would have been wonderful. But there was not one. They had to re, rely, rely on the sacrifices and following the law the way that God's word said they needed to at the time. And then it would point to Christ. It would also point the fact to the fact that we are sinners and we need God. So is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should, uh, should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all are under sin, that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The scripture showed us then that we're all under sin, that, and that we need to have that faith of Jesus Christ, that it might be given to us, to be able to believe, that we would believe, and have that eternal life. Look at verse 23 now. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So before Jesus came and before we could have faith in Jesus Christ to be our Savior, they were kept under the law. They were shut up. They were in bondage to do the law. What a terrible way to have to live. I mean, it was the best they had at the time. It pointed them toward the Messiah that would come, but they had to be in obedience to do the sacrifices and, and to keep the law. And by the way, they did not have the Holy Spirit living in them, in their hearts, giving them the discernment to know how to live. They had to have it spelled out like the law spelled it out for them. They had to have the guidance that came from the laws of Moses and from the things that they put, put in there, but they added a whole lot more than they needed to, the traditions of the Jews, they added all that. It had to be a tedious way to live, but yet they exercised faith to live that way, pointing them to the law uh, that would claim, that to, to the word of God that would point to Jesus Christ to fulfill the law. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And here's what it's saying. The law in the Old Testament was given to us that it might teach us how Jesus Christ would come to fulfill the law, how the Messiah would come and set us free from ourselves and from sin and from the law by fulfilling the law and pointing us to Christ so that we might accept Jesus Christ in faith. Notice this, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So if anybody tells you, asks you, what about that Old Testament? What about that law, the laws of the Old Testament, you know, that was mentioned, the Mosaic laws? What about it? What was that all about? You can say, well, we're not under the law now. We are under the law of Christ, his forgiveness, 
the Savior, having faith in Jesus Christ. And by that, we are set free from the bondage by being kept shut in by the law. We are no longer shut in by the law. We have a freedom that the Holy Spirit gives us to be able to love and to be able to live the way we need to by having the, uh, the determination through the Holy Spirit of living the way we need to with the help and discernment from the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful. You and I uh, no longer are susceptible like we were before we were saved to have to do the things that, the, that Satan and his temptations caused us to think that we had to do. Now we have the leadership of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit showing us what decision to make. One of my favorite books is What Would Jesus Do? And by the way, that is uh, written by Charles Sheldon. And uh, it, was a, it was a good, good book. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, please do. There's also a contemporary version talking about what would Jesus do. They took a, a vow together, a certain group of people in the church. And by following the, the idea of let's ask the Lord what we should do before we do anything and see how it changes their lives. And it was wonderful. You ought to read it. And you know, that's something that, a concept that I think we should all try to keep. What would Jesus have us do? After all, if he's living in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and now we have discernment through the Holy Spirit so that we can be have access through Jesus Christ to what God wants us to do in our hearts and minds, then why not ask Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What is it? How do you want me to handle this situation? What about this problem? What would you do? What would you have me do? It's a very good concept and I think a very worthy concept that you and I could follow because after all, if Jesus Christ lives within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, why would we not ask Jesus what we should do? So when we look at this, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Thank goodness we are not under the bondage and we are not under that not shut in like we were before, but now we have the freedom of the Holy Spirit not to sin, but to know the difference between what's right, what's wrong, what the best choices are. I always mention this to people. You know, it's not just about not sinning. It's also about knowing what God's choices are in our lives. Because, listen, there may be a lot of good choices in this life that you and I, opportunities that we could take, choices we can make that will make a difference in our lives. But I look at it this way. We have choices to make. And those choices can be good, better, or best. I feel like I've chosen the best wife I could possibly have gotten. I tried a few different things to different, few different girls. And, and when I was dating in the dating days, and some didn't want to pray with me. Some didn't like the idea about going to church. Some didn't think it was a, a, a wonderful thing to talk about God, because I talked about God a lot, and some people didn't like it. So listen. Here's the way it goes. Why not marry your best friend? Why not marry the one that loves God just as much as you do? That you can talk about heavenly things about, you know, with, and that you can discuss how God would lead you in your life together. So I'm saying that you can choose the best results for your life, or you can choose something lesser. And God wants the very best for you and I. A lot of times it's about the choices we make. In fact, it always is. What choices do we make that would cause our life to be everything God wants it to be? According to God's Word, Romans 8, 28, I love this verse. I, I mention it a lot, I know, but I want to share it with you again. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. When, when we love God and are called according to His purpose, that means we've come to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've accepted the call. And that means he can take all the problems we've had in the past, all of our mistakes, all of our things that we thought were okay that weren't, things that we didn't quite do the right things with. He can take all of that, and he can work it out for our good. How that happens, I have no idea. I couldn't figure it all out, but God can. So if you've got problems, you have issues from your past, give them to the Lord and, and he will make the very best out of them. 
He can straighten out the problems that you've been through. He can take the things, the problems, and, and the circumstances, the sins. He forgives them. He causes us to be a new creature. And he's able to use even the past to make things better for us if we allow him to. And notice all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for you and I. I'm not talking about a happenstance existence where, oh, we might do God's will this time, or we might, we might know what God wants to do and hear another time. No. According to God's word, the Holy Spirit living within us, Jesus Christ showing us through his word, through the preaching, through the study of his word, and in our hearts, he can cause you and I to know God's perfect will. He can cause you and I to know God's best choices. So that we can know his purpose and follow it rather than our own plans. So as we look at this, we uh, no longer need the schoolmaster, which is the law. All we need the law for is to show us that we are sinful people. That none of us are righteous. Not one of us. God's law teaches that. That we need salvation. And points us toward the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We are God's children. And God wants the very best for us. You know, don't you want the very best for your children? Of course you do. Do you always do the very best? Well, we try to. We hope to. But sometimes humanly, we do fail. But God is not going to fail. Like our own earthly child, children, we want to... Do the very best for them. But God is much greater than you and I. He's much greater than worldly man. And he's, he's much greater than you and I being human. That he can cause you and I to know his perfect will. So that you and I can do things his way. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. You are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We've become a new creature. We have a clean heart now. You and I have a mediator which is Jesus Christ the righteous. And when we do sin, he's there as our go-between between the Father and us where we do mess up sometimes because we're humans living in this human world. And when we do, we can ask forgiveness. We don't want to do the things we used to do. We don't want to do the wrong things. But if we mess up, then God can forgive us if we'll ask forgiveness. And he will cause you and I to continue to live for him the way that we need to. Now, that's not a license to sin. That's actually a way that you and I can continue to live in faith with Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and live in faith knowing God's continued purpose instead of stumbling and not being able to find our way again. Because we will stumble sometimes. But when we do, we have Jesus Christ the righteous right there for us to help us find the way back to help us find forgiveness that we need. He is our mediator. You wouldn't need a mediator if everything was all right in your life because sometimes you have problems. Sometimes you need direction and you need the mediator, the advocate, which is Jesus Christ. When it says advocate in God's word, advocate is our attorney, the one that represents us, the one that's there to show the Heavenly Father that we belong to God the Father be, he has been, we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and by his body, by his flesh. He sacrificed himself for us. And he is our mediator now, our go-between, our attorney that represents us before God. Yes, Father, but look, they've asked forgiveness, and I've given my blood and my life for them. And God forgives us. Now, it's not a pleasant thing to have to be forgiven, but it is a pleasant thing to be forgiven. And so if you are living with problems in your life, sin that might have crept back in, because Paul said to the Galatian people in that area, he said, should you sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No. Just because you know that God can forgive you, should you do wrong? No, of course not. We should try to be the person that God wants us to be, to know his way and his will. And by the way, there's no excuse not to know his way and his will if we've got the word to read and we've got the Holy Spirit living within our hearts and Jesus Christ, the righteous, as our, God, our advocate and our mediator, you and I have no reason to fail. 
God's word says, with every temptation, he's prepared for us a way of escape. So when there you are tempted, just begin to ask, Lord, where's my escape? What do you want me to do here? How can I get out of this terrible situation that looks like it's coming my way? God can give you the escape you need to not do the wrong thing. Now, and to help you to do the right thing. Remember, sin is not just doing the wrong thing. It's also failing to do the right thing. So we have to understand that. Now, as we look at this, I love this. It says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean the whole world or the, the whole, whole world is full of the children of God. What that means is he is our creator. But those of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are God's children. We are through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, can receive the blessings that he has for you and I. Now, God's word says about these other people that, that don't know the Lord, he says, well, the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. In other words, God blesses those in the world anyway because he's the creator. But however, the, re the blessings of God the Father to his children are different. They're above the blessings that come to just everybody. These blessings that his children receive are wonderful and essential, necessary. And so if you and I, being the children of God, uh, are receiving those blessings, it's only by the grace and mercy of God, his salvation through Jesus Christ, because we are the children of God. Now let's move a little bit further. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So when we have been baptized in Christ. Now that means we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. But baptized in Jesus Christ means also baptized by the Holy Spirit. That means you and I have received Jesus Christ. He's come into our hearts and you and I have been changed because of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit fills our lives. But it also means this. We've been baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. That means now he's a part of us. He's in us. Now we can live the way he wants us to. It's also referring to the water baptism also because here we now have a need to be baptized, to declare unto everybody that we've been saved. That's what baptism is. Dying to the old man, raised to walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. We have a new life now. We can walk in a newness of life because of Jesus Christ. And now we can have victory over the old man. Now, Paul said it this way, I have to die to that old man daily. He had to battle that old man daily, just like you and I do. But he can have victory over the old man, and he can live now in a newness of life. That's what Paul was saying, and that's what he says to us. We have a newness of life in Christ Jesus. Now, it goes on to say, we have, as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So now we have Christ in our lives. We put off the old man, put on the new and that is the new man that's in Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ. And now, uh, verse 29, or verse 28, uh, There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here, God's word is saying, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or somebody other than uh, a Jew, like a Greek or a Gentile, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a bond man or a slave. Or if you are free, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. We all are one in Christ Jesus. That means we are all of the body of Christ. We can all come together in one mind and one accord and worship Christ because we all are the children of God that have trusted in Jesus Christ by faith. And it says, goes on to say this. Now, by, by the way, I want to mention that because we all can be saved, there's no excuse for all of us, any of us, to not be saved. Because John 3.16 says it pretty well, that all of us have salvation if we will just trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jesus died for the whole world that we might be saved. Now when it says that, it means no matter what male, female, Gentile, Jew, Greek, or whomever, whatever nationality, we can all be saved. Look at verse 29, through faith in Jesus Christ, that is. Verse 29, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, you have all those wonderful promises 
that were given to Abraham. Did you notice how God watched over Abraham? How he took care of him no matter what was going on? How he promised him that he would be the father of many nations? Listen, we are the seed of Abraham. We are one of those people that God's word promised Abraham that we would be his. We would be belong to Christ. We would be of the seed of Abraham. And through him, we can have faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. So I want to leave you with this. Don't forget what the function of the law is. When people ask you, is the Old Testament necessary? Of course it was. Without the Old Testament and the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, how would we have known how far off we were and that we were lost and needed Jesus Christ? And without that, how would we have been pointed toward Jesus Christ? How would they have been pointed toward the Messiah that was going to come? They had faith that he was coming. We have faith that he's already come. And we've trusted him as our Savior. So, yes, let them know. Yes, it was necessary for the Old Testament to be there, for the law to be seen, to be read by us, to be understood. And it's also necessary for you and I to have what the New Testament shares with us about Jesus Christ and his purpose, the, the gospel, which is the, the birth, death, and re resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, the birth, the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel means good news. Yes, so we need the good news too, along with the Old Testament, so that we can be saved and that we can know what it means to live the way that Jesus wants us to live. Well, let's come to a close now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. We don't pretend to be perfect. We need you, Lord. We need you every day. Father, we need to know how to live every day. We need your word. We need Jesus Christ, not only as our Savior, but as our mediator, helping us to see what the best choices are in our life every day through the Holy Spirit living in our hearts and in our minds, causing us to be that new creature. Help us, Father, to live your way. Help us to make the best choices, not just the better choices and not just good choices, but know the very best that you want from us, that we could do the right things, not only preventing ourselves through the Holy Spirit from doing the wrong things, but make the right choices, the best choices, and do the, the be obedient to your will through the Holy Spirit and through your word. Father, I pray that if there's, there's those that are lost today, that they'd ask forgiveness, Lord, as you're listening today, ask forgiveness for their sins and ask you to come into their, Jesus Christ to come into their hearts through the Holy Spirit and that, Father, they would begin to, to, that they would believe that Jesus Christ died for them, rose again on that third day, and that he they can be victorious over death, hell, and the grave through Jesus because we can have that salvation because of Jesus. How wonderful that he was victorious and that we can partake in that eternal life through him. I pray, Father, that if there's one that's lost, that's listening, that you'd help them make that best decision they've ever made by coming to know Jesus Christ, your son, as their Savior. And Father, they would live for you. And that's the best life they could actually live, ever live, is to live for you. We thank you, Father, for your word that's gone out tonight. We pray you'd bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And remember now, we'll see you Sunday if you can make it, make it with us over at the church, at the building, in the building, 817 North Sugar Street, Salina, Ohio. May God bless you.